United States Army reveals new devices to clear enemy minefields. This is the M3 device, better known as the snake. A tank pushes the 400-foot snake and its 5,000-pound explosive charge into the field. To blast a path by detonating the enemy mines, machine gun bullets from the tank explode the M3's charge. For clearing anti-personnel mines, another snake, the M1, comes into play. Its charge is propelled into the minefield by a jet motor. In heavily mined areas inaccessible to tanks, the M6 takes over. This double-barreled snake thrusts out over 1,000 pounds of explosives. Its charge can be set to explode at a predetermined point in the minefield. starts on its sizzling way. Skimming over the land, it heads for a lake. But this projectile is amphibious and crosses water hazards with ease. world's heavyweight boxing champion tests his famous right arm in bowling practice. These are just preliminary exercises before Lewis starts intensive training for his championship match with Billy Kahn in June. The champ's timing looks pretty good right now. At Hot Springs, Arkansas, challenger Billy Kahn takes to the road to harden leg muscles then into the gymnasium to work on timing his punches. The challenger is taking his training seriously. His shiftiness of foot almost beat Lewis in their first bout in 1941. This easy-looking exercise is really torture, but it's guaranteed to reduce the waistline. Khan is working hard for his second chance at the title. Last time, Lewis knocked him out. <laughs> A streamlined ferry boat is the first commercial vessel equipped with radar to guide it safely through night and fog on congested Puget Sound between Bremerton and Seattle, Washington. The magic eye that set the Navy's course of victory in the war is now at work in the post-war world, showing the way through dangerous fog-bound waters. On the radar screen is revealed the presence of channel markers, obstacles, and shorelines, a scientific marvel charting a safe course in the peacetime pursuits of commerce. Past Sugarloaf Mountain into the harbor of Rio de Janeiro steams the mighty new aircraft carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt a United States goodwill ambassador to the inauguration of Brazil's new president. The maiden voyage of the world's biggest carrier is a mission of diplomacy. By air transport, as personal envoy of President Truman, comes New York City's former Mayor LaGuardia in white suit for this summer season in the Southern Hemisphere. Guardia holds a press conference in Portuguese with a little help from an interpreter. He is well known in South America because of his active support of the good neighbor policy. Sinusure of all eyes, he arrives at Tirandente's palace to attend the inauguration of General Eurico Gaspar Dutra, newly elected president of the United States of Brazil.
Congress, for the ceremony of General Dutra's induction, are gathered diplomats and officials from all over the world. The provisional president, Jose Linares, hands over the reins of government to the first chief executive ever elected by direct popular vote in Brazil. One more honor for the Republic's distinguished soldier. Later at Catete Palace, former Mayor LaGuardia meets the president informally to convey President Truman's and America's best wishes for a successful democratic administration. Florida's sponge fleet, the largest in the world, resumes full post-war operations. At the sponge beds, divers prepare to reap a rich underseas harvest. This single fleet of less than 200 boats takes a $3 million cargo each year out of the Gulf of Mexico. Working 150 feet below the surface, divers range wide areas to rake in the sponges. Natural sponges are mashed to press out foreign matter. Fouled airlines and occasional attacks by sharks and barracuda make sponge diving a hazardous occupation. Tarpon Springs is marketplace for a big time industry located at the bottom of the sea. In much of Europe today, this is the setting brought to pass by the heedless greed of Nazi overlords who pillaged the country and brought down upon its people the terrible burden of war. Cities like this in Czechoslovakia are what the displaced persons of Europe are coming home to. Every day they return, bringing with them what small hopes have survived the hell of Buchenwald and Dachau. The degradation stripes of prison uniforms are often the only clothing they possess. Hope of liberation kept them alive for six years, but their great need is for food and clothing. And food, for instance, is 25% below the pre-war level. Distribution, another problem, is expedited by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration using United States Army trains and trucks. Because Europe will depend until her next harvest on outside help, President Truman has directed drastic conservation of American wheat fats, oils, and dairy products, the return of some wartime rationing to America if necessary, and an increase in export to needy peoples. American military transport, enlisted by UNRWA to aid in its reconstruction program, gives first priority to the delivery of medicine, for where there is need of food and shelter, there lurks disease. Clothing from overseas helps out against the cold of a hard winter, which has yielded little fuel. UNRWA distribution stations face the fact that if they fail, the heavy hand of misery will fall upon millions of innocent people who survived the war and now face the hard reconstruction period of the peace. Thank you.